Welcome to the Meditation Conversation, the podcast to support your spiritual revolution. I'm your host, Kara Goodwin, and this is a wonderful episode featuring Mary Jo Cranmore. We dive into fascinating insights about numerology, astrology, and tarot. Mary Jo gives her impression of what's happening in 2024, including the powerful eclipses which are fast approaching. As an intuitive astrologer, tarot reader, and spiritual path teacher, Mary Jo helps people understand their mission in this life. She's passionate about connecting the dots astrology lays before us and how we can use that information to create true and lasting happiness. By revealing a person's life purpose using the tools of astrology, tarot, and numerology, she believes that armed with that awareness, people become unstoppable. So be sure to check out Mary Jo's YouTube channel, Soulful Revolution. And also check out karagoodwin.com, where you can get a free 10-minute meditation. If you want support for your meditation practice, I have a 21-day online program to help you develop your own practice. And you can also get a personalized recorded meditation slash energy transmission to help you get through whatever challenges are showing up in your life. I also have a recorded Sacred Geometry Workshop series available that is very powerful as well as the Healing Hearth membership where you can get live online assistance with your questions about meditation and life. All of that and more on karagoodwin.com. And now enjoy this episode. So welcome, Mary Jo. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Hey, thank you. I'm excited to be here too. Thank you. So how did your path lead you to astrology and tarot and all of the things that you're focused on now? It is a little bit of a, a, a long story, but I will give you the Cliff Notes version. And <laughs> I did start uh, learning about astrology and numerology and tarot when I was in college. It was just something that I was interested in. It was a hobby. I became really good at doing tarot readings in college. It was something that I I would always have like a deck around the house and stuff like that, but it was not any kind of main focus. And I went to college for journalism and for film. I was working as a journalist in, as a producer, a television news producer in Miami and Chicago for NBC and for ABC and up here in Portland, Maine. That's how I got to Portland, Maine. And I left TV because it was very stressful. And your life is really not your own. You really do get moved around quite a bit. And so I, for about five or so years, I taught people how to be on video and to make video for their businesses and to help them understand what people wanted to know. Like, why would they be searching for your business and things like that? So I was getting to the, I was very burned out by that work because at the time, this was like, 2010, 2011, 2012, it was not like the ubiquitous thing of video that video is now. And I just took video for granted because that was my whole life. So I didn't realize that like people weren't like super psyched about being on camera. Uh, I was like, what are you talking about? Of course you want to. If this is your business, you have passion for it. And so I finally got so burned out by that whole thing that I just it just ground to a halt. Like it was like I, a, a car with no oil change. And I just stopped being able to do it. And a couple of friends of mine are like, why don't you just do something else? And I was like, this is what I went to college for. What am I supposed to be doing? This is what my degree is. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You use the degree. Good for you. But what else do you like? And I was very much in a financial pickle because of business loans I had taken out and everything like that. And I was going to just change everything. And I went to this attorney and she talked to me about it and I just felt freed by that. And so I came home and like the next two months, I was just like, huh, what am I, what should I be doing? And literally my bookcases are full of astrology and the chakras and soul contracts and da, 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 and tarot cards just everywhere. And I'm like, huh. What should I do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Show right. me a sign, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I do? Right. And then I was like, okay, I had a final project in Dallas. Someone sent me a an article from the New York Times. It was talking about tarot on YouTube was such a big deal. And I was like, how does that even work? What does that even mean? And so I came home and I, I went on YouTube and I 
zoomed around. I found a bunch of people and I was like, oh, okay, I I get it. This is uh, you plug into general energy. I've been doing that. But just with one person, you plug into general energy. I learned how to do that. And I started posting. I started posting videos and the channel just took off. So that lawyer and I were going down the road of bankruptcy, of all kinds of loan, forget all kinds of stuff. And I went back to her a few months later. I'm like, I don't think we're going to have to do this. I think I can, I think I can fix this mess. And she was like, that's fantastic. So yeah, so the channel just started growing. That was 2017 into 2018. And it just kept growing. That's incredible. Wow. And so Talk to us a little bit just about cards and numbers, because you have a lot of different modalities that you use, Mm. and I'm curious about how they help people to understand themselves better. And I know from my own experience, I've had numerology readings, I've had psychic readings, I've had star genealogy readings, and all of these different ways, gene keys, human design, all of these things. And what's fascinating to me is how much they sync up. 100%. It's crazy. And it's so specific. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I I find that amazing, too. And for me, it's like the layers of it. A lot of people that come to the channel, they know they're a sun sign Leo or I think my boyfriend's a Libra or something like that. It's very mainstream to get a Zodiac, to look in your newspaper and you get a Zodiac newspaper. Oh, my God. (laughs) I was thinking that. I'm like, are people doing that? No, no (laughs) one's doing that. No one's doing it. (laughs) I know what you mean. Yes. Right. So (laughs) no one's doing that. But it's super mainstream, right? Super mainstream. And there's a book called The Divine Triangle, Numerology and the Divine Triangle. Mm -hmm. I don't know these people, but I've had four or five copies of this. It was published in the 70s. I don't even think there's a Kindle version of it. I've had the paper version of it. I've beaten them up so many times. Do you know who wrote it? Faith Javane, J-A-V-A-N-E, and Dusty Bunker, I believe. Oh, interesting. Okay. (laughs) Interesting name. But these, I like this book because they paired the tarot up with astrology, up with numerology. Oh, and so that I found that book because that book was published in the 1970s, I believe. I found that book in the 1990s and I was just like blown away by I liked the kind of 360 degree kind of way of looking at things. I liked that it took away for me the stereotypical nature of, oh, oh, you're Sagittarius or of course you're Scorpio, like that kind of thing. Where everyone's like, all Scorpios keep secrets and all Sagittarius, you guys are a bunch of flakes. Like it took away the, and I'm Sagittarius, full disclosure, but (laughs) it it took away the, just that kind of like broad brush stuff and it made Mm -hmm. it more personal. So it made it more individual. And that's when I started really understanding about astrology being personal, interpersonal with Jupiter and Saturn. And then the planets that are further out are generational. Because they move so slowly. Is that like Saturn and Chiron? and Well, Saturn and Jupiter are in this interpersonal band that is like close to our personal planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus. But it's like the furthest out barrier. At the time when astronomy, we only had certain amount of power in our telescopes to be able to see that far out. So Jupiter and Saturn were like it. Okay. And then beyond that, in the 70s, they discovered the asteroids. Chiron moves between Saturn and Uranus. So Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto are generational because they move so slowly that huge chunks of people are born with the exact same Pluto degree or the exact same Uranian degree. These kinds of things, it started to deepen for me to understand, okay, yes, you're a sun sign Sag, but look at all this other stuff. And then if we pair it with numerology, you can just get such a deeper reading. And even when I'm doing general readings, the frequency of the numbers, the vibration, the frequency of numbers connected to tarot, connected to astrology, for me, that just brings in so much more depth. Mm. Oh, it's so fascinating. Mm. So Let's shift over to tarot because I I don't know a ton about tarot and I find it kind of confusing because you've got like different numbers and then there's like of cups and of, you know, 
So we don't have to necessarily go into that level of detail, but just generally, how do you use tarot to help to fill out your, the right. info you get on someone? I think that a lot of people think tarot is a predictive tool and it's really not meant to be used that way. What tarot is for me is an empowerment tool. So instead of asking, like, what is that person going to do? I prefer to ask, what's my best reaction? What's my best? How do I uh, navigate this situation to my best and highest good? And also, how can I take a look at the current energy, right? The current energy that's going on. That's what I do with a general reading. I'm plugged into Gemini. I'm like, okay, do a little meditation on Gemini. This is what's coming through. Okay, I feel that. I'm a Gemini moon, so mm, gotcha. And I'm a Gemini then, sun. Are so. you Gemini sun? Excellent. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No wonder. So then I'll work with that a little bit. And every tarot reading is a possibility. Your job as the person watching is to discern, use your intuition. Is this for me or is this not for me? And you're also, if you are in a looping kind of pattern that you have, or if you're in a victim mentality, or if you're in something that is like that, you're not going to choose or make yourself available to the highest level of vibration that could come through. Mm. If you are in a higher level vibration and there's things that come through in the cards that show possibilities of difficulty, most people who are in a higher vibration goes, okay, how can I use that? How can I work with that? All right. I know that when we're on this planet, not everything is fairy dust and unicorn. So if I'm going to have this situation come in toward me, I want to know about it and I want to know what's my best reaction or action or my best direction. Okay. Yeah. So that's how tarot works. It's a vibrational empowerment tool. Okay. And it's not predictive. That's interesting. To me, or you don't use it that way. So I'll follow on to that because I'm sure everyone was like, what? what? It's not predictive. <laughs> it's basically showing you the path if you choose to do this, right? Because within the spread, we usually have like best actions, what's blocking, things like that. If you choose to go in this direction, this is the thing that could happen. Oh, okay. Okay. This is the thing that could show up for you. There's other people involved. Other people can make decisions, but you can only control you, right? You can mm -hmm. only control what you're doing and what you're choosing. So I, I do a reading for myself every morning. Like, what's my best use of today? What can I expect from today? How do I navigate this sticky situation I find myself in? And if you start to become a student of your own patterns, then you're going to see that in the tarot reading. Because mm -hmm. you're the one who's exuding that vibration, and that is matched. The energy is matched by the cards. It's shocking to me how mm. right on it can be, even wow. when someone's not in the room with me. It's surprising. That is surprising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. So what about your guides? Do you have guides outside of the cards and the numbers and so forth? Yes. And most I'm teaching uh, my Pathfinder group to access their intuition, to know what it feels like, you have a high self, right? Your higher self. This is your, when you're in alignment, you are not only connected to the earth and connected to spirit, but you're also have the possibility of getting above your high self to connect with your spirit guides, your two main spirit guides, you have protection guides, you can call on other guides to help you with specific things. But all the chakras have to be clear. All the chakras have to be working in order for you to access the third eye, access the crown, and then what's above. When I first started recognizing that I was in like this eighth, ninth chakra stuff, like that's above your head, I really recognized that I've, I did not do a good, as good a job as I should at protecting myself because not everything that's flowing around the universe is all supportive to you and everything like that. So you do want to be able to learn how to connect to your high self, to know when everything's in alignment, to protect and to only allow messages that are meant for your best and highest good to come in. It doesn't mean they're all sweet and kind and generous and lovely. It just means that, oh, this is important for me to know. And so you're in that place of, okay, thanks. So you're not manifesting with some like 
sky god out there, what you're doing is you're connecting with your own guides and you learn that the universe is like your coach right next to you. Okay, how can we work? How can we manifest this? How can we move? And my guides, Isabel and Isaac, um, I didn't realize this. I, I heard someone else talking about initially when you find your first guides, they're usually they're, the names are start with I because it's I. Oh, interesting. And I was like, yeah. And this was like two years ago. And I uh, heard that just a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, oh, holy cow, Isaac and Isabel, right? Isaac is like the ghost of Christmas present, like this big body kind of energy, just this maybe has a Scottish accent. I'm not sure, but like <laughs> Viking for sure. And then Isabel is like this sweet older lady who's always in a flower garden. I'm always seeing her in the floppy hat and she's always in the flower garden. I go out there and we talk to her. I talk to her and She's very nurturing. And Isaac is the one who's like a little kick in the pants guy. And he's the one who has the sense of humor and all of that. But then you can call in after you start working with them once you learn to protect yourself and learn what that feels like. Okay. And so what is that discernment like for you in terms of like you because you mentioned recognizing when you're aligned and that yes. that's an important part of the protection. So can you give some insight in how that works for you? Yeah. So most of the time, if I, I come down here, I have a, a very, I live by myself. So I have this routine of in the morning with Charlie, my dog, and then we come, I do my own readings. I do my own meditations and I come prepared, like I come ready and I just plug myself in. It took me a while to get my morning routine so I could just plug myself in. But I pick up the deck and if I have this like a little feeling of, whoa, something's going to come through, like something's exciting. This is I can't wait to see what happens with Aquarius today or whatever. I know I'm like doing it. If I'm like and this doesn't happen very often, sometimes I, I the energies can be a little crazy with everything that's going on in the world. There can be a lot of we have eclipse season just coming up now as we're talking and those things can throw you off a little bit. They mm -hmm. can. And so you have to be just be kind with yourself and not I definitely I have Mars and Capricorn. So I'm very determined, which has never really been an issue because I've pushed myself through things a lot in my pre in my previous incarnations in my life <laughs> with other kinds of work. But now I'm like, OK, you know what? That's all I can do today. I'm supposed to do like Sagittarius and Capricorn and Aquarius. And then later on, I'm supposed to do da da da. -da. But sometimes I can't. Mm. And giving yourself permission to just be like, you know what? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just feel, I just, whenever anything comes through me, sometimes I can't get the words out fast enough. Yeah. If I'm, if there's a lot of messages coming through, sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Like a lot, some of the readings are just like, there it is. That's mm. what the reading is. But other ones, I put down the cards and I'm like, I hope there's a story in there somewhere because that looks weird. And then all of a sudden it'll just start. And sometimes I can't get the words out fast enough. That's how I know that like super plugged in. Yeah. But if I'm pushing and I'm searching for words and I'm, I'm like, okay, what's this? Like, why is that happening? And a lot of times it's just, you've got to stop. And does that, does that equate to interference? Cause it sounded like when you were talking about like the the protection, because I really appreciate that understanding the difference between like, this is actually coming from your higher self versus yeah. sometimes we can be in a place where it's like, well, that's not me. Yeah. Getting that information from me. But then it's like, well, is it in my highest and best good? You know, and how how can people help to know when it is coming from a, a good place, for lack of a better word? I, I think that a lot of times when people are learning to use their intuition, uh, first of all, they doubt themselves. They've been gaslit since they were little kids that they don't really know, that they don't really have this knowing or they don't have um, intuition that gives them any good information. Every time I follow my intuition, it sends me down a bad road. Actually, sometimes you have to learn a lesson. So it's not that just being plugged into your intuition is going to always send you in this super duper beautiful energy, a lot of times that intuition is going to, is talking to you all the time. And sometimes you heard, you've heard yourself say this, oh, I knew that, I knew that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. God, I knew that was, why didn't I listen? You know what I mean? For me, in terms of how people can know is I believe in journals. I believe in journals because I want you to prove to yourself that you have intuition. And if you don't 
write things down when they happen. You get a little intuitive hit. Oh, that's interesting. And I write it down or I'm thinking at the end of the day as I'm like emptying out my brain into my journal. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was interesting when I did that reading and this happened, this body feeling happened. You need to learn you. You need to learn your own body's way because it is in your body. It's your body's way of communicating. If you're I don't trust any reader who's constantly up in in the ethers all the time without being grounded, because in order to give advice or give counsel of any kind, there has to be because we have a 3D life, there has to be some connection to it. That feeling of being both anchored and connected is what we're learning. And so I think people don't ask questions enough. People are like, how do I know the name of my guides? And I'm like, can you ask them? Ask them. And then whatever. And just listen. Like, I'm not going to tell you what the name of your guide is. You have to ask them and you have to build a relationship. And how people can know is I learned that I would when I said something and I would get like this feeling of like tingles on the top of my legs. I was like, oh, yeah, that was it. Like I got to it, whatever I was, Mm -hmm. whatever I needed to say, like tingle, tingle, tingle. Okay. I said that in the video. I got there. Good. Yeah. (laughs) I love that it's at the top of your legs because I get it a lot like down my back or in my head, like in my hair and all. So I'm like people who watch the the show or listen Mm there. They've heard me say a gazillion times. Oh my God, that gives me so many chills because I I don't feel it all down my back. But that's so fun that you feel it differently, like same but different, you know, different. for you at the top and, of the legs. Yes. And so what is your thing? Everybody's got their own thing. I know that we can have some commonalities. There are many times when I do feel like the top of my head coming off or something like that. Like when you wear a ponytail too long and mm. you're like, ah, like that feels so good. To that <laughs> yeah. Um, so that can be it. But if you have to be a student of your own intuition, yeah. you have to. Pay attention. And I have a little story I will share with you because people always ask about signs and symbols. Like, how do I know what that means? And I'm like, okay, you have to create a catalog of your own meanings. So you can go look up what 444 means and that's fine and cardinals and stuff like that. But if when you're starting to talk with your guides and work with your guides, I asked my guides, I said, I'm having a hard time making this decision. And I want to know if this is an idea that I should pursue, that it will either bring me some new understanding or it will bring me happiness or whatever it will bring me. But if this is a good choice for me to make in terms of my growth, then show me a blue umbrella. Mm-hmm. Ask for the symbol because everyone's like looking out there for symbols. It's like your symbols, your symbols. So it was August at the time. And I was like, blue umbrella. You never don't ask for something that you can just look and see. Right. Right. Like ask for something that may be a little out of place. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking it's August, not a cloud in the sky and everything like that. And I live in New England. So I went into this place called Ocean State Job Lots, which is it's like different every day when you go in there is different stuff. And I looked up and there was like a wall full of blue beach umbrellas. Oh, wow. And I just laughed right out loud. And the lady was like, we don't have that reaction. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But it was so obvious to me. I was like, there they are. It was like two yeah. hours later. Was, there they are. Yeah. I love that. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Mm. And so then when you talk about the journaling, it's maybe building almost a catalog where. Yes. Yeah. That's that's really smart. I yeah. Love- Ask for it. I have like my personal connection to numbers. My birth time is 321 a.m. So whenever I see 321, I'm always like, Blast off, you know? Oh, yeah. Three, two, one, blast off. And your own personal connection with numbers or with whatever can mean something specific to you. Mm. So start building that catalog and journaling is really a great way to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I understand that you've had some discoveries about the roots of patterns. And I think that this ties into astrology and the karmic path that we're all here for. Can oh, yeah. you talk to us a bit about that? The patterns, it's so interesting to me that we all do have our patterns. And what I'm, when I'm saying about patterns, what I'm looking at or what I'm seeing is that 
you have free will. You absolutely have free will. And for whatever reason, this particular pattern, you have you feel like you have to go and do it again and do it again and do it again. And it's happened to me many times with relationships. I can see patterns in that. A lot of times in tarot readings, you can see when something is like on repeat, on repeat, mm -hmm. on repeat, especially in your own life. If you read for yourself and you see the same cards over and over and over again, that can show you that you're stuck in a pattern. Most of the time, people stay in patterns out of it's just comfortable because I know what's going to happen, even if it's a terrible pattern. Even if mm -hmm. it's something that I don't want, sometimes moving away from patterns can upend people. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of a lot of the people that come to the channel are wondering how to just block people out of their lives. I want to block my twin flame or I want to block this particular this narcissistic pattern. And I'm like, you're going to get more of it. You're going to get more of it. You're going to get more of what you don't want if you do this, if you like put up a wall. What you need to do is you need to look the monster in the eye and be like, bring it because you're here for a reason. I want to get this over with. I don't want to have to do this again. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to walk right up and look you in the eye and be like, what is it? What am I missing here? What am I missing? And a lot of times, like in the movies, right, when you look at the monster, it loses power mm -hmm. because it's not it's no longer making you run and making you do lots of stuff. You're like going right up to it. Those are the people that usually survive those scary movies are the ones that go right up and be like, not be afraid and have a plan about how to deal with that. But patterns can also show up in a subconscious way in our life. And we just think that this is how life is. Yeah. Like it's belief systems that come from family upbringing. If you've gone through some kind of poverty or some kind of maybe divorce has happened in your family, maybe some other kinds of stuff that's happened and you can form a belief which calcifies into a conviction that this is how life is and those kinds of things so you can see those things in numerology you can see them in tarot and astrology astrology you would look at saturn to see things that are your i don't know patterns you could only do it once you only may only have to do it once but looking at saturn is a good way to look at your lessons in your astrology or in uh, tarot, I use the cards that are underneath the deck after I shuffle to see what's going on relationally to the reading, but also what's going on subconsciously that you might not know about. Oh. Right? And so half the battle is just becoming aware of like, oh, wow, I didn't know how that connected with that. Mm -hmm. I never connected that. So I, I think that's part of my mission is to be somebody who connects dots for people. Yeah, that's right. really powerful. Mm. Yeah, I love how you say that calcification. Ugh. That's really powerful, how we can Ugh. just have these beliefs and then they just like become almost solid mm. and, and how that can hold us back. I think about that a lot, too, just with our patterns and, and how culture and society plays into it, because you talk about parents too, you know, like the family we're brought up in. Yeah. And then we also have the society that we're in, the culture that we're in. And having lived in a couple of different cultures for, mm. you know, years at a time, it's like there are things that we really take for granted as just being how things are. And mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. oh my gosh, a lot of that has to do with like the borders of our country or of yes. the state, even of yes. the state that we're in. Absolutely. Which is and I, bonkers. Well, I'll tell you, the nothing hates, nothing hates letting go of a pattern more than a culture. Mm. And because it's like it's it is it's like almost woven into the fabric of what that culture is. And we have right now we have a Pluto transit that's happening in astrology, which I'm you might have heard other people talking about mm -hmm. it because it's happened. It's so slow. A Pluto moved into Capricorn in 2008 when the banks fell off a cliff. And Pluto m crushes things or blows away things that the foundation has become calcified, that calcification of a belief or that conviction, becoming a conviction that this is the way this should work. And then they corrupted it to such an unknown degree that it had to blow apart. It couldn't operate anymore. And we just had Pluto go, it swung all the way through Capricorn and it moved into Aquarius in January of this year. 
And so Capricorn is the old guard, the old systems, the things that the hierarchical system, all of that kind of stuff. Aquarius? Nope. Aquarius is all about the future. Aquarius is all about innovation and change and transformation and everything. And so having that Pluto energy swing from one to the other, you're seeing a lot of that in the world, that there's like this sense of things cannot stay. Every single pattern or every single institution is being questioned right now all over the world. Right. Not just for the for Americans, but all over the world. Very interesting. That's happening right now. That's very interesting. I have heard that about Jupiter. I'm curious, you know, here we are in in March. And do you get some senses of what this year is going to be like? Because I hear that it's going to be a powerful year. And I know personally for myself, even though we're just a couple of months in it, it I've noticed a lot of changes in my own life with this year. So what what yeah. do you what kind of feeling do you have about 2024? I will say that I think there is going to be some major, major shifts going on this year. I will say that earlier this year, like with that Pluto movement into Aquarius, we're going from an earth sign into air. So it's faster. So the everything is moving faster right now. That Pluto energy is going through and like crushing things and, you know, Godzilla walking through the city, like getting rid of anything that isn't um, up to snuff. And we do have these eclipses happening March 25th and April 8th is a big eclipse in Aries. The one that's happening in March is in Libra and they are tied in. I won't bore you with the math or or the astrology, but there's something called the North Node and it is a lunar node around the moon. North Mm -hmm. Node and South Node is an ellipsis around the moon. It's just a mathematical point, okay? But last year in July, the North Node moved into Aries and South Node moved into Libra. And, and these are these are the mo- nodes of the moon, you said. Yes, these are the nodes okay. of the moon. Because we and have it, those on the planet too, right? Nodes. Yes, but this okay. like coincides with moon energy in terms of eclipses, okay. right? So all of the eclipses are going to align with those signs. Okay. So Aries and Libra are opposite signs, right? Aries oh. is about me and Libra is about we. Oh, okay. It's about independence versus coupling. It's about how do I still have power in relationships and not disappear into them? Or how can I have, how can I stop bigfooting my partner in relationships, like balancing the Aries and Libra? And these eclipses now, we have the lunar eclipse in Libra, five degrees Libra happening March 25th. And that is going to be about opening one's eyes to see what's really going on. And then am I going to be a people pleaser, a lower vibration of Libra, or am I going to then reach for Aries, which is about asserting my power? April 8th is a solar eclipse, and that one is in Aries. We also have Aries, Aries Sun, Aries Moon, and Chiron in Aries, all at 19 degrees. So, Really? Yes. On the 8th? On the 8th of April. Wow. And so that is known as a stellium three or more planets in the same sign. There's other stuff, other asteroids in there too. But it is going to be a powerful, energetic expression of people's power. If you have been fading into the woodwork at work, it's whatever's going to be going on in your life is going to like shove you forward. You have to make a choice here. And if something is like hurting you or no one's listening to you or something like that, you may find your voice. You may find whatever that personal power element is for you, you may find, and if you look at your birth chart, where is this hitting for me? So if that eclipse in Aries hits like in the 10th house, it could hit your career. Hmm. And it could be like, you know what? I'm no longer, I'm not going to be just a cog in the machine. I'm going to start my own business, Hmm. right? So you have to see how that is all working. April 20th. We have a Jupiter square or Jupiter conjunct Uranus in in Taurus. And that is Jupiter expands anything it comes in contact with. And Uranus is about innovation and change. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of a sign that doesn't like innovation and change more than Taurus. Taurus is like, I'm super comfortable right now. And this is just lovely. You don't need to do anything. Uranus says there is no such thing as safety without risk. You must have risk in order to have safety. 
You must risk and invest money in order to have safety. You must take a risk and look for a different kind of job if you want to expand your horizons. You must start your own business. You must get married, you must get divorced, whatever it is. And so Jupiter is a benefic, a lucky planet, right? It is that really gorgeous energy of expansion and Ju- and Uranus is expansion too. So there can be a lot of money made around this. It depends on where it falls in your chart. There can be a lot of love expressed, right? It's just a beautiful energy and Taurus likely will go kicking and screaming. But I think Taurus will be like, after it's over, be like, oh yeah, I wanted to do that. That sounds yeah. good. <laughs> that's that's I'm a good idea after all. Here, but I don't- yeah. <laughs> Right. And so then Jupiter moves into in May, Jupiter moves into Gemini, which, again, is an air sign. So things are going to speed up more. Wow. So we have this we have a lot going on just in this next three months. That is really going to force us to see if we're circling a pattern Mm. or anything that needs to be innovated is going to get expanded, like right in our face. Like you're not going to be able to avoid this. And when Jupiter is going into Gemini, Gemini is all about communication. So there can be a lot of experiences that happen for us, maybe privately, Taurus, maybe privately, that as soon as Jupiter moves into Gemini, we have this major need to confess or we have to communicate or bring our learnings, our key learnings back to the tribe or something Mm. like that. Right. Like we 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 are now going to be reporters right? Responsible for sharing our learnings. Wow. Well, thank you for all of that insight. I'm curious. I hadn't thought before about April 8th being 4-8-2024 from a numero- numerology perspective. I'm actually right. I live on the line of the, the eclipse. Yeah. So it's a big deal around here because Do a lot you of really? people- Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so it's been on my radar for a long time. And, sure. and it's right when we come back from spring break, too. So I've been like for months, we have to be back before, yes. you know, I don't want to be stuck somewhere. No. Um, but anyway, but the I hadn't thought about the numbers. So April 8th, four, eight, two, two, four. Yeah. Is that is there oh, significance so there? So 2024 is an eight year, Uh the 8th of April, obviously, and the four, four and eight is 12 and eight is 20. So it's a 20, a two zero. I like having a zero because that's a God protection. Mm. Um, Two is the the energy of choice decisions. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. So when you have a 20 number, that's going to be boiled down to a two, obviously. But don't lose sight of that zero because that is God's protection as you are making decisions. Mm -hmm. So I like that, especially when we're talking about Aries energy. A lower vibration of Aries energy is I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. Mm -hmm. Screw you. I'm just doing it. The higher vibration of Aries energy is the benevolent leader. Mm-hmm. who is doing things, not quite an Aquarian, where Aquarian, we all have to agree on everything. Aries is definitely making the choice, but they're, they're, they are having their inner divine feminine kind of soften and not be, I don't know, gruff and hard edges and hard elbows and stuff. So I like that. That makes me feel like there's a, a lot of initiative happening. Eights are the number of initiative and putting in effort Fours are the number of structure and the number of four of wands keeps coming up in the readings, too. And that's a lovely number about moving or surprises around our physical life. And I would definitely say that about April 8th. It's always been for me right smack dab in the middle of Aries season. You're gearing up to do things you want. But I like the connection to the four, which is more about how are we working together on something? So that's Mm -hmm. not going to be lost. That won't be lost. Fascinating. Well, Mary Jo, this has been so much fun and I've learned so much. Thank you so much. How can people find you and connect with you? My YouTube channel is called Soulful Revolution and I post there every day. Not every reading every day, but I do post in the morning and I post Zodiac readings during the week. I also post the Twin Flame reading and once a week. And you can check it out at Soulful Revolution TV. That's the YouTube channel and my website, 
I have all my classes and my memberships and everything there. So you can just go plow around in there and see what you think. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. I've really loved this. I appreciate you coming on. Me too. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure.